friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop with another edition of a Not So Live Shop Talk. This one, unlike the last one though, is going to be packed full of questions and answers. Got lots and lots of old stuff here. This is all very old. So I apologize that we haven't got to it sooner. Most of this is actually from December time frame. So um, anyway, it's a lot of questions and answers and we're going to go through a bunch of those. Wanted to bring you up to date on a couple of other things. One week ago today, almost to the exact hour, unloaded a whole bunch of firewood, and I showed you a little video on that. That was one week ago, seven days ago exactly. And I was hoping that it was gonna last, you know, three weeks, two weeks for sure. Well, not so much. Uh, the weather got so darn cold down here in this valley. It's like five degrees this morning. And uh, I told you I burn a cord of wood about every three days when it's like this. Well, trust me, I have burned at least two cords of wood this week. I may have one cord left out there. I burned at least two thirds of all that wood you saw. And so here's a look, a quick look at the pile that's left as of right now. Well, my friends, it's 1130 <clears throat> Saturday, one full week after we hauled all that wood. This used to be a giant pile of wood here, as you might remember. All we've got left are the really big pieces that need to be split, so I'll have to bring the bobcat up and split that. And we've got this little bit of wood right here. This pile here went almost all the way to the uh, wood stove here. So all of this wood has been used, and even some around on the perimeter has been used. So it's very, <laughs> that's how much wood I have used. I mean, this was a huge pile. I would say I've burned two and a half cords since last Saturday. It's crazy. I was expecting that wood to last three weeks and I'll be lucky if I can make it, well, I know I can't make it through another full week if the temperatures stay like this. This here is more wood than it looks like because it has to be split, but because those pieces are pretty big and some of those pieces are fairly large too that need to be split. But uh, I would say we got maybe three days of wood left, and that's about it. Yeah, I'm sure some of you, when you saw those big piles of wood last week, last uh, Saturday, thought, oh, that'll last more than two or three weeks. <laughs> Trust me, that thing sucks the wood down. And, you know, and just to head off all the comments, need to insulate the house. The house is insulated. Trust me, it's insulated. Probably better than your house. Um, you know, it's the attic is insulated. I furred out all the walls to six inches, insulated them. I replaced all the windows, all the doors. The problem is 7,000 square feet of concrete and it sucks the cold in. And then there's been all kinds of get on me about, uh, you know, well, redo the floors. Well, you know, can you afford to do 7,000 square feet of floors? You know, I mean, that's pretty expensive, number one. Number two, it's just not practical. Um, the floors are nice that we have in there. Uh, they're just not going to stop the cold from coming in. And even if we did cut up all the way around the perimeter of the whole thing and put a thermal break in, we might get a 10 or 15, maybe a 20% savings. For what that would cost, it would take more than my lifetime that I have left to pay for that. So the point is, Nothing's going to change on that front. It's just going to be as it is. And uh, and as I mentioned before, in a way, it's kind of good that I have to cut so much firewood. It kind of keeps me limbered up, sort of. Of course, it kind of wears me out at the same time. But anyway, I, I, I actually kind of dread the day when I can't cut the firewood again uh, because that just means the end's that much closer because, <laughs> you know, whatever. I don't want to get on that subject okay let's uh let's move on to this, a couple of other things i've got a couple of gift things here i want to show real quick i mentioned this one in last week's i believe it was about this microphone that uh, you can see the shape of the microphone here and the microphone is inside yeah um anyway uh i didn't know who had sent it to me because i had lost the paper well i found the paper it was all like i said it was just covered up in piles of other paper <laughs> 
And it was John Hansen again of the Livonia, Michigan, uh, L-I-V-O-N-I-A, Michigan. So thank you, John, very much. We will give this thing a shot here one of these days and see what we can do with it. In addition, I uh, answered an email, I believe, or a question or something from a, a viewer. And uh, this is from uh, Charles, and I can't pronounce your last name, Charles, I'm sorry. Salkowitz, I believe. S-A-L-K-E-W-I-C-Z. Salkowitz from uh, Florida. Because I answered his uh, question about his instrument and everything, he sent me a few sets of strings and $20 to have a pizza on him. Well, thank you so much, Charles. I appreciate it very much. You didn't have to do that, but I certainly do appreciate it. I think that's uh, got me caught up with all the gifts at the moment. Thought I might just uh, talk about, you know, getting around to it. You know how people are always trying to get around to it? Well, how about a guitar around to it? You know, you know, get around, guitar around to it. There you go. Guitar around to it. <laughs> this is actually going to go uh, with the 12 string. This is the uh, sound hole out of the 12 string guitar. So uh, this will be put in the case when we ship the uh, guitar off to Scotland later. So just thought you might get a kick out of that. Um, I also have made a lot of progress on the 12 string, but I'm not going to show it to you because it's all the detail work of all the different inlays and things, the pick guard, fretboard, uh, the end pin stripe, uh, yeah, I don't know, a whole bunch of things, peg, peg head, and it really is looking cool, but I don't want to give all that stuff away. I want to wait to see that either in the video or the final video. Well, that brings us back to all of these things, and there is a bunch of them. So let me read them, and we'll take them one at a time here and go through them. Well, the first uh, message from a viewer is, I believe it's Rick Tedder, I believe, and he's emailed a number of times and uh, conversed with him a few times. He says, I always thought I had pretty sharp chisels, but I watched your video on how you sharpen your chisels. And... Uh, he says, I can say my chisels are much sharper than they've ever uh, been. He says, I'm amazed at the difference. And he says, and it, and it doesn't take near as much effort to, to uh, cut with them and uh, to do the sharpening, I think, too. So anyway, thank you, Rick, for that comment. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there are different uh, videos out there, and I don't recall which ones they are, uh, where I do show sharpening with the uh, the, the chisels and I sharpen them believe it or not on a regular round grinder 8 inch or 10 inch 6 inch will work and basically it's a technique of what you call hollow grind so when you this is the round grinding disc and this uh, is your chisel blade and you know you turn the bevel side against the blade of course and you try to very carefully hold it and and go right across the the uh, take the chisel right across the uh, stone like this as it's spinning and that arc that's in the stone will be the perfect arc in the end of your chisel and even on a 10 inch radius believe it or not it will make an arc in your chisel and you try to get one perfect grind across there instead of like you know just getting up there and wiggling it around you know you'll have all kinds of facets on the end of your chisel basically i have one continuous facet called a hollow grind then i just take that that hollow grind you know and i'm exaggerating but you could say the hollow grind looks kind of like that on, on that bevel and you lay that on your flat whetstone and I use just plain old oil and uh, you work it around like that and so it's only writing right on the very bleeding edge and on the very back of the bevel and uh, you just just a few strokes like that on a good fine wet whetstone and then you turn it over and you just flatten the the back side it just takes a couple of seconds I mean really from start to finish I could do the whole thing in three minutes I'm sure and then I just maybe stroke it on some leather a few times. And uh, I mean, they are just absolutely razor sharp. Uh, you, you can just shave with them, you know. I mean, they really are. So if you haven't seen that technique or whatever, I invite you to look it up. Uh, you could probably find, uh, R if you just type in RSW chisel, you'll probably find it. I, I hope you can, if I have the keywords out there for you. Anyway, thank you for that comment, Rick. 
The next one's from a John Maselli, and he says, I have been a fan for many years, and I have been attending Luthier School for a little over a year. And he says, I have a friend who has had several instruments built for him. He just emailed me uh, discussing um, the virtues of bone uh, versus, uh, you know, cow bone versus antler versus buffalo horn, that type of thing. And he wanted me to mention what I think about all that. Well, John, by the way, is from Belgium, it looks like. I'm sorry it's taken so long to get to, to this, but here's my take on the whole thing. Bone and deer antler are pretty much the same. The difference between the bone and the deer antler is the bone can still rot if it's, if it's a green bone. In other words, if it's fresh out of the animal, it kind of needs to be cured, bo uh, boiled, or at least dried some way. Where antler isn't like that. You can pretty much take the antler directly right off the deer and use it. It's pretty much a dry bone already. In terms of sound quality and whatever, I don't think there's a big difference. Um, I think that the antler is uh, good uh, because it is, you know, keep in mind they fight with the antler, so the antler is just that much harder perhaps. So I think it's a very good sound transfer. So I, I can't really say that I think antler is better than bone, but it's at least as good or possibly better. Now, when you talk about different things like horn, that's a totally different thing altogether. Buffalo. You know, if you're talking buffalo bone, well then it's the same as a cow bone. But if you're talking buffalo horn, that's a completely different thing altogether. That's not bone at all. Horn is basically matted hair. That's, it's a different material, it's keratin. It's too soft, in my opinion, for uh, saddles and for bridges. It'll work, uh, but in my opinion, it's too soft for that. It will give you a different tone, I'm positive. I, can't say I've had enough experience using the uh, horn. I have used it years and years and years ago, and you know, obviously I'm not using it now, so I'm, I'm sure I wasn't terribly impressed. What I have used horn for is making picks. Guitar picks works great for making guitar picks. Now they do feather out to a feather edge and they do wear and that sort of thing, but they have a real nice sound, a real nice action. So, uh, you know, buffalo horn or even cow horn would be the same pretty much. And you can make picks out of that and it does make a pretty good pick, really. That's my take on it, hope that helps you. This next question was from early December from a Pete, and Pete is asking, he says, that he, well, he first is complimentary about my videos, and he's been watching especially about the sunburst type finishes that I do on the instruments, on the mandolins primarily, uh, using the Phoebing's leather dies, and he says he loves my results, and I also, you know, I just want to be clear that I, I use the leather dies uh, and, and you know, alcohol to remove dyes and things. And, and it's shown in a lot of my videos and how I do the sunburst. But then I go back with an airbrush and with some dye in the airbrush and I darken the outer edges it, with some lacquer. I put, so I mix dye, le, uh, lacquer, and uh, spray it around with an airbrush. And that kind of makes kind of like a translucent paint almost. And uh, that kind of evens out the outer edges and things, and then I can come in slightly on that too. So, so I, in addition to just putting it on by hand, I do the thing with the airbrush also. But he's asking about, after he does that, he's concerned that the true oil might make it run or whatever. I haven't had any problems with the true oil making the uh, Phoebing's leather dyes run. It doesn't seem to do that. Um, it seems to be co totally compatible. So I haven't had a problem with that. I have been actually spraying the, the uh, true oil uh, varnish. The true oil varnish isn't, I don't think, really meant to be sprayed, but you can spray it. But the thing about spraying it is you have to do it incredibly light coats. In other words, you go across it and you're done. Don't go back across it again. You move down and you go across it. You move down and you go across it with your sprayer. <coughs> If you try to get bold and, and go over it a couple of times, you will get runs. Take my word for it and just be patient and put on very, very light coats and it will spray really well. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm joking here. <clears throat> I got a, uh, <clears throat> a lung infection, chest cold type thing back in early December. 
Here it is, February, mid-February, and I still have it completely shook it. Don't think there's something extra wrong. I get this every year. I've gotten it every year for about the last 20 years. It happens every year. I think it's something to do, believe it or not, with cutting firewood and uh, being out in the woods in the winter t or in the fall. Uh, Daryl that was here said that he thought uh, maybe it was the cedar pollen, and it could be. But anyway, I get it every single fall without fail. And it lasts all winter. I can't get rid of it. I tr try all kinds of medicines, go to the doctors for it. It's just some sort of an allergy type thing. <clears throat> and anyway, this next one is about my bandsaw mill, and it's from uh, Paul in Minnesota. And uh, he was wondering if I have any plans for the bandsaw mill. And the truth is, no, I do not. I don't have plans for almost anything I make. I pretty much make everything just at, on the fly as I... I design it on the fly. Now, don't get me wrong, I think it out. Sometimes I'll draw it out on paper a little bit here and there, but I don't make any specific plans on things for the most part. So sorry, I don't have plans. This next one is from a fellow, uh, uh, John Cook, it looks like, and it was back in November. So I apologize again. These are just things that have been piling up on the desk here. His question is about uh, grain direction on guitar parts, basically. I mean, he, he, he gets kind of specific, but it, in general, his question is, you know, how much does it matter which way grain is running on things? Well, it does matter, I think. Um, like, for instance, the, the, the neck block and the tail block, their grain should run perpendicular to the sides. If you have the grain running the same way as the sides, if the sides split, the block can split, or vice versa. And I've seen that happen. And I've actually seen it happen quite often, where a guitar will split, and then it, it splits the block and everything. And generally, when you look at them, those grains are running the same direction. If you have the grain running perpendicular, it's much stronger to the other part that it's going to. So to me, whenever you have the chance to run grain perpendicular for strength reasons, you would want to do that. Uh, an example would be on a, you know, a bridge. The bridge should have the grain running perpendicular to the, the top grain that's running the other way. Um, I mean, it's, most of it's fairly common sense, but it's just stuff that you should think about. You know, in terms of a neck, uh, you know, I like, I like to make multi-piece necks because if you have all the grain running one way on a neck <clears throat> and it's all perfect, well then over time that grain will all have, the, you know, have a tendency to curl with the strings. All of that grain running the same way will eventually pull up with the string pressure. But if you take and make your multiple piece necks like I do. You got grain running all kinds of directions. They don't match up. And and I also turn the grain like kind of, well, I mean, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It's symmetrical, but it's like the grain will be running like this on the outer outside edge pieces and they come together and then my center stripe down the center. Well, anyway, the point is that makes it very strong. So think about grain direction. I think it's incredibly important myself, and it's very important a lot of times when you're doing restorations and, and, and fixing things that are broken. Anytime you're gonna fix something that's broken, if you can do it, you want the grain to be perpendicular to the break. <clears throat> Especially like little cleats and patches and things, all of those things should be perpendicular to the, to the break. So I hope that helps you there, John Cook. I know it's way late in coming. Hopefully you're still watching my videos. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, the next one here is from Rick Tedder. <clears throat> and he's, uh, he says, uh, I am amazed at uh, what I've learned from your videos. He says, I've repaired a lot of broken guitars now. And he says, I've uh, taken a page out of your playbook and I've started using a Paduke as the... Um, bridge plates in, in cheap guitars and stuff. And he says he's amazed at the sound difference. So thanks, Rick. I'm glad you're uh, getting something out of the videos there. Hope it uh, continues to help you. Hope you continue to watch. This next email is from, uh, it looks like Anthony, A-N-T-O-N-Y. Anthony uh, King. I don't see where he's from or anything, but uh, he says he's been a fan for a while. He was had a question about guitar cases and and uh, and guitars in general and the moldy smell that you get and and the mold and mildew problems. Well, <clears throat> Anthony, 
I would like to tell you I'm an expert on that, but I'm not. Um, and the truth of the matter is I typically just buy off the shelf mold and mildew products from box stores. And that's typically what I use whenever it's a real problem. But the truth is, I don't know that much about that subject. And if anyone else does or has a real good recommendation, uh, feel free to put it in the comments because I don't feel I'm an expert in that. This is another older email um, and it's from Scotland, a fellow in Scotland there. And uh, I, this could be a semantics thing and it could be, you know, saying one thing meaning something else. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not going to mention the fellow's name because I don't want to embarrass him in case he, you know, does mean what he says here. But if he does mean what he says, I think he's wrong. Anyway, he says that uh, he had purchased a guitar kit and uh, got it. I think it was for Christmas. He got a, a Christmas gift, <clears throat> and he said the neck was back bowed. Now, to me, back bowed means that it's got a hump in the fretboard. Uh, under bowed would be you know, where you would have relief or too much underbow in your neck. So if it's backbowed. So he said he tightened the truss rod to straighten it. Well, if it's overbowed like that, you wouldn't want to tighten it. You would want to loosen it. So, you know, that's the problem. And see, like, there's a lot of two-way truss rods. While we're on this subject, two-way truss rods, man, they're, they're just asking for trouble because people don't understand righty tighty lefty loosey at all and i'm sorry they just don't um <laughs> don't take offense i'm just telling you for sure i see it all the time in fact i'd say 80 percent of the time they're adjusted backwards 80 percent of the time eight out of ten times on a on a two-way adjustable truss rod i'll look at the the instrument and i go whoa that ain't right you know and i'll go to hold uh, the truss rod and it's really tight you know and it's tight the wrong way it's it's been it's been uh, like loosened until it gets tight again and you know it, I don't know how to explain it but it's backwards from the way it should be so you should understand your truss rod before you go messing with it that's the main thing but in this case here if you have a back bow which to me that would be like this um, then you would want to loosen your truss rod which would let it do that so, hope that helps. <coughs> Christopher Borzich, it looks like, is the uh, email here. This was December 29th. <laughs> and uh, he says, I'm a woodworker, a garage woodworker. I'm not a professional. Um, he says, I was wondering why you don't use steam to straighten uh, necks rather than just heat. Well, honestly, I don't remember doing any videos where I straightened the neck too much. Uh, I, you know, I've kind of applied pressure to them and things, but for the most part, here's my take on straightening a neck or straightening anything, the, the top or anything. It just doesn't work to try to straighten them with steam, heat, anything. In my opinion, it just doesn't work. Sure, it'll work temporarily, but just think about it. And it's just simply, a, I think it's just a common sense thing. The strings pulled it into this underbow shape or whatever, and you can straighten it back out with heat or whatever you want, but what's gonna happen when you put the strings back on it? It's just gonna pull it back up. I mean, it just is. Now, it may take it a day or two, it might take it a week, it might take it six months, but it will pull it back in there again. So in my opinion, almost all the time, whenever you are straightening something just with pressure, you're fighting a losing battle. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. I'm entitled to it, just like you're, just like you're entitled to your opinion. Um, I see people doing all kinds of crazy things uh, on the internet all the time. And I look at it and go, well, it'll work, sort of, but it won't work for a long term, you know. So that's why you see me take the bridge plates out a lot of times and replace it with a little larger bridge plate and, you know, a better bridge plate, a better piece of wood. But you also see us take a flat board and lay it across the, the top of the guitar and push that bulge down uh, and get the top of the guitar flat. In fact, I've even so much as made them underbow on a rare occasion a little bit uh, <clears throat> so that when I glue that back in there that it won't pull back up. Anyway, the bottom line is my 
feeling on any kind of straightening issue, you have to fix it mechanically. You can't fix it just by simply heating it and changing it. So I don't know if that answers your question or not about the steam. I'm not a huge proponent of steam anyway. Um, I've used it a lot. I, I actually built steam boxes and things when I first started and tried steaming wood and, and had limited success. I mean, it worked, and uh, but I don't feel like the steam is that great. <clears throat> it, it, it depends on what kind of woodworking you're doing. For instrument work, I don't feel like steaming is the is always the best choice. I'm not saying it won't work on certain things like sides and, and things like that, but it's not my first choice. And that new side bender I have, by spritzing it with water and putting it on there and with the metal around it, that basically is steaming that side and that, and that metal holds the steam in. So to me, that's the way I use steam. <clears throat> and I, I might just add one more thing about the steam. And, and I've said this before, but Paduke has this weird property because when I'm bending a guitar side, for instance, I have boiled Paduke for hours. And so it's completely 100% saturated and the water is bright red or orange or whatever color it is. I'm colorblind. But anyway, it's, you can tell the water has changed colors from the dye in the, in the wood. And the wood is completely saturated soaked. So I take it out of there. It's hot. You can't even hold it by hand. It's that hot. So you take it out and you put it into the mold and you start to press it down. Before you can even tighten the mold, it's already completely dry. It has this weird property. It dries almost instantly when you take it out of hot water or when you take it out of steam. I've done it both ways. You can take it out of the steamer, walk over to the press, it's already dry. I mean, it's like bone dry. I'm not exaggerating. You should try it if you don't believe me. It's crazy how fast it dries. So that's another reason I'm not big on the steam thing. Okay, let's move on. This next one is from Stephen Saunders. Again, this was back in December as well. And uh, he was asking about my uh, Nashville number system. And he he pointed out a problem, I guess, on my website, uh, you know, on the, on the website where I'm on my for sale page, where I'm selling the guitar and selling the mandolin instruction on the guitar. I mentioned that it is the national number system on the mandolin. I did not at that time. They both are based on the national number system. And so I just want to clarify that they are based on that. And I did update the website to include the Nashville number system explanation on the mandolin training. So thank you for pointing that out. The next fellow here is a Chuck Thompson. He says, uh, I watched your uh, <clears throat> video on Mandolin 101 and I enjoyed it very much. Now, I think he's talking about a video that actually a music store put out there where I was training a class of people on how to uh, play the mandolin. Um, but anyway, it, it still features me and talks about my Nashville number system approach and that whole bit. But he's talking about his hand specifically, and he says he has the use of three fingers on the left hand. Index will not bend at the first joint, so he can't even use his first finger. Well, you could still play with just the three fingers. Um, I, you know, we're, if, you, if you think about the, the uh, four finger chord, you got these two fingers together and then these two fingers are up further up on the neck. <clears throat> You would just simply leave this one off, put that, those two down there as the first two. This one would be your third finger then, and the fourth string would just be open. And you, so you try to miss the fourth string. That's the way you would do it. Um, you know, I, I could do that if I had to, but I wouldn't love it. Um, I do play a lot of three finger chords and leave the little finger off. I do that all the time. So, you know, uh, when you're leaving a string open on the mandolin like that, typically you don't hit that string. So I just, you know, you just kind of learn a technique to not hit that string. That's all. Hopefully that helps you. Well, I hope you got something out of today's shop talk. Uh, there was a lot of tips and tricks there, and hopefully uh, they uh, were beneficial to you. If you do have something that's really bugging you and you want to know the answer to it, well, send it to me, and I'll try to include it in a future shop talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah.